Does a kneeling make a difference? In particular, does a kneeling your brass cases help you craft ammunition that's more precise? Well, stick with me in this episode. We're going to get started on a large experiment to answer that question. You know, in our past season of extreme reloading, we looked at annealing and specifically asked if annealing actually makes a difference in our brass cases. And I tested a bunch of brass cases that were annealed versus not annealed. And you can watch that entire episode. I'll be sure to put the link in the description below. But the answer to that question is yes, annealing does actually change the softness or ductility of those brass cases, and specifically at the mouth or neck of those cases. But the next question is, does annealing make a difference in our precision? Well, that's our experiment, and we're going to get started talking all about that in just a second. All right, let's talk about brass or case preparation for this annealing experiment. You know, consistency is very important if we're seeking accuracy. My old mantra, major plasters words, in fact, is consistency equals accuracy. And if you're a long time watcher of extreme reloading, you've heard me say that quite a number of times. But consistency is also very important whenever you con conduct an experiment. What we want to do whenever we're experimenting in a scientific type of experiment is we want to control for all variables save for the one that we're testing for. And the one that we're testing for is annealing. So 50% of the cases that I've prepared have been annealed, the other 50% have not been annealed. And I'm using federal premium brass. This is once fired uh, federal brass. And uh, there's actually, I prepared 68 of these cases, knowing that some might be absolutely culled out for one reason or the other. And what I needed was 60. And actually, I had more than enough, only one ended up being culled out by being very, very light. All the rest of the cases were pretty darn consistent. One was a very, very light case. So that one got kicked out. And what I'm doing for my preparation of these cases is my standard uh, precision rifle uh, case preparation where I start with, you know, I'm just, I'm just wiping down that brass. Uh, it was fired once, taking a very close look at it for any sort of problems that may have happened. Once fired brass, had no problem with that. Uh, I go through my case head uh, fracture inspection looking for uh, incipient case head separation. Didn't find any problems again, but I always test it. And then, of course, I lubed those cases and went through a full length resize um, and um, uh, cleaned them. I cleaned those cases once I got the primers popped out and then went into trimming. I trimmed them all to exactly the same length. I'm, I mean exactly the same length. Uh, using my Wilson case trimmer and then I headed over to the case prep station where I chamfered and deburred, cleaned up those primer pockets and uniformed those primer pockets. Now one thing I noticed when working with this federal brass and it's fairly different than the Lapua brass that I'm accustomed to or more accustomed to, uh, but this federal brass seems to have a deeper primer pocket right out of the factory, right out of the box, more or less. Uh, in fact, there are some, lots of instances where the primer pocket uniforming uh, didn't even touch the very bottom uh, or the ceiling of that primer pocket uh, as part of that process. So I will note that that is a little bit of an inconsistency throughout this, but pretty darn marginal, although I do know that uniform primer pockets makes a big difference when we're looking at ultimate precision uh, long range. I should also mention that those case necks were sized with a uh, 0.334 inch bushing. And by the way, this again is I'm loading for the 308 Winchester. 
And then I annealed. I'm using the annealies. Uh, I've got other videos out there about the annealies. And um, uh, I used the setting of 48. I did a little bit of experimentation on these federal brass cases. Normally on Lapua, I'm using a 50, 50 setting on that annealies. This uh, federal brass needed a little bit more. Uh, I think it's a little bit thicker brass, it appears to be, when I'm doing some quick measurements. So I went to a, point, uh, a, a 48 setting on that annealies. Every one of them ran exactly the same. Uh, and so that, again, is part of that consistency. Every case that was annealed was annealed in exactly the same way. And then I expanded the mouth of those cases using a 0 0.3060 expander mandrel. And when all that was said and done, I then weighed and sorted all of that brass. And I ended up having four different groups or sets of brass. Uh, three of those sets had 10 cases in total. The other one had uh, 30 cases in total. Of course, 50% of those were annealed. 50% of those were not annealed. Now, this was once fired brass. And one of my concerns is that, well, you know, may, maybe after a single firing, the case necks didn't harden that much. And I may not see much of a difference in this experiment. But I did a little research on that, and Ryan Stevenson's thesis dissertation document, now I've used some of his work before, referred to it in the, some of my previous annealing videos, but he did some really interesting measurements uh, to help him earn a doctorate degree in engineering. And one of the things that he did was he tested case hardness, uh, the case neck hardness is what we were interested in, with brand new brass out of the box, he was using Lapua brass, by the way, the hardness of those case necks at one firing, a second firing, a third firing, a fourth firing. And what he found was that that brass started at a value of 100. Approximately 100 was the hardness, and he was measuring using the Vickers hardness scale. And after a single firing, that brass jumped up to a hardness of 140, then slightly higher on the second and third uh, firings, up to about 150 and where it plateaued. Then when he annealed again, dropped it down to about a 100 on the Vickers hardness scale. And then once again, they start popping up very, very quickly to that 140, 150 hardness value. So if this federal brass, federal premium brass, which was annealed, according to the literature that I could find on federal site, it was annealed prior to uh, loading, then that once fired brass is going to be fairly hard or harder than the annealed stuff that I just re-annealed. So we're going to see if that makes a difference, and if it doesn't make a difference, I'm still skeptical about that, I'm curious about that, I'll probably end up doing a second firing to make some additional comparison. So now I have a bunch of brass ready for loading, and I'm going to start priming these and loading these things up here in just a little bit. But all of my sets that I have, there's eight different sets, uh, all of those things, the case weights vary by less than one grain, so I'm far below 1% of the total uh, weight, plus or minus 1%. And the case outside diameters are identical. Um, within a thousandth of an inch. So that's really cool. I'm very, very happy about how that turned out. We've got some extremely consistent brass to work with. I'm going to go ahead and get started reloading these things. Well, that takes care of that. I now have 60 rounds loaded, and they are extremely uniform and consistent. Now, what I've done is I have used CCI large rifle primers. These are bench rest primers. Some of my favorite primers are these CCI bench rest. This is the BR2, so large rifle primers. I also like the Federal Gold Medal match primers quite a bit. Now, one thing I did is I purposely opened up a brand new container of these uh, of these primers. So every one, all 60 of those rounds, was using. Uh, primers from this box right here. I'm also then using RL15 powder, 
very good powder. Actually, it performs a little bit better in my 308 compared to Varget that I tried and tested out years ago in this 308. You know, Varget is kind of my go-to powder for so many other rounds that I am loading, but RL15 uh, tended to beat uh, Varget just a little bit in consistency. And then I'm topping all that off with Sierra tipped match king bullets. These are 168.1 grain bullets, Sierra tipped match kings, and these are weight sorted bullets. Now, that's not too terribly important really, so don't run off and start waste, weight sorting all your bullets and thinking that that's the, uh, uh, the magic bullet. It's not. We did a test in our previous season and it really doesn't make much difference. You know, these bullets, probably any well-made bullet on the market today is consistent, fairly consistent. Yes, slight deviation or slight variation in the weights and slight variation in the overall length of those bullets and length to the ogive, just very, very, very slight. Thousandth of an inch maybe on those measurements, a, grain, a tenth of a grain or two difference, uh, and it really doesn't matter. Uh, these bullets are consistent enough within a uh, acceptable level of tolerance or an acceptable level of uh, error or uncertainty and it really doesn't make any difference. But since I already had these weight sorted, I said why not I'll go ahead and use these for this test, making them officially just a little bit more consistent. Now my set one, three, and four started off with 10 pieces of brass, cases each, that was subdivided into five and five for each of those sets. 50% of those, remember, were annealed, the other 50% were not. And so uh, I have one group of um, what I'll call group one and group 1A annealed, and that'll be shot back to back when I head out to the range here in just a little bit. Same thing for groups three and four. Ten rounds to start with, broken up into two subsets of five each. Now group two had 30 rounds to start with, subdivided into 15 each, half of them annealed, half of them not, and then since I had 15 rounds, I was able to do a little bit more resorting of those finished rounds, and what I did is I uh, sorted by the neck tension, wasn't too much to sort there, they're very, very consistent to start with, but then I also measured what's called CBTO, cartridge base to ogive. And so now I have uh, three separate sets of group two uh, and three separate sets of group 2A, and those are going to be shot side by side uh, to further improve the consistency of this test uh, and remove those variables uh, save for the variable of annealing that we talked about at the very beginning of this video. Well, I'm ready to go out and shoot the very first groupings. I'm going to be shooting set 1, 1A, and uh, at 200 yards see how all this goes. Quite a jump. That felt good. That was good.
SpaceX in pretty similar velocities. Is it flying up and to the left? Good. Uh oh, looks like he really flew off to the left farther. <laughs> Velocities look fairly consistent here. <laughs> That's all right. Well, session one is in the books, and when we compare group one to group 1A alpha, then what we're seeing is that, and if this trend continues, the non-annealed brass was far more precise than was the annealed brass. We ended up with a five-shot group of 0.5 8 MOA, this was shot at 200 yards again, and an annealed group, annealed brass group of 1.52 MOA, so quite a bit larger. But comparing one sample of one group, five shots each, isn't really the full story. So we've got to give this a fair shake. Remember I have already prepared 60 rounds that's 30 annealed and 30 not annealed, and we're going to keep firing all those and do some statistical analysis to really answer this question of, does annealing really matter? Well, thanks for watching, and you won't want to miss our next episode. We're going to keep heading back out to the range. We're going to be talking about different ways to measure these groups uh, and the statistical approach we're taking to this experiment. Thanks for watching.